Thank you. I love it. I love that we're going from the future of APIs, you know, machines, talking to machines, to the future of humanity. What I'm going to talk about. <laughs> Sorry. So um, I'm going to share three stories with you today. And the stories will give you a glimpse into where the world's heading and how to take advantage of it. All right. Before I do, start. Um, actually, one thing I'm going to ask you as well, I'm going to probably ask questions as we go. Uh, just start now getting bold and brave. It's going to be a lot more fun and interesting for all of us if you're kind of leaning forward and, and involved with the talk. All right. So I am Andre Sluisman. You can uh, reach me through Twitter at, at Glusman. Uh, and I am the Chief Strategy Officer at Meet. And how many folks in the room uh, use Meet? Sweet. So nearly everyone in the room. Thank you. Uh, it was really heartwarming. Uh, so I'm gonna. The first story I'm gonna tell you is how we got so that everyone in this room pretty much is using Meetup, uh, and I'll reveal our playbook along the way. All right. So Meetup creates community, right? And if you know Meetup, uh, you might know it for the very specific thing that you are involved with that you love doing. Uh, but in general, Meetup creates community, and I'm gonna show you some some photos of some different experiences around the world of what community does. Community changes lives. Right, so here in Buenos Aires, Argentina, you got people who are learning languages by basically conversing with other people who happen to share another language. So this gentleman here has a German flag and an Argentinian flag, and that means he wants to speak German with someone, and he's willing to trade his knowledge of Spanish in exchange for German, right? And you see it all around the room with different kind of flags. Right? You got community helping people learn new skills. This is Code Crew and Meetup in New York City. Uh, it was started by a husband and a wife team who wanted to change careers. They wanted to learn how to code. There's a ton of stuff you can do on the internet to learn to code, uh, but they didn't want to do it alone. So they created a meetup group just so they could go to a coffee shop once a week and be held accountable to these other people and exchange advice and tips with people who uh, also were going through what they were going through. You know, lo and behold, a few months later, they're now both employed as developers, which is sweet. Uh, and this code crew in New York has spawned meetups that are similar all over the United States, which is great. Right? Meetups help people collaborate, like the Salesforce developer meetups. Girl Develop, but another very similar story, but in this case, uh, two women in tech who were tired of there not being women in dev in tech, and so they said, we're gonna do something about it in New York. Uh, and lo and behold, that was a huge success, and that's spread group by group by group all over the world, I believe. It's a really cool success story. Girl Develop, check it out. Uh, meetup helps, community helps people find support. Uh, and this is an interesting kind of support too. This is people who have young transfer survivors. It's like you're not your garden variety uh, support group in a church basement. These are people who like to get together and go out. Uh, the only thing is that they all happen to have cancer in time. Right. Uh, and this is my favorite one. So this is a surfing meetup. I surf. Um, the thing about it, I've seen this photo for years, and it never occurred to me, I never realized that that's actually in London. Right? Not exactly where you would expect to find a ton of surf. So Meetup not only changes lives, the community changes lives, a profound fact is that community extends lives. Okay? This says here, according to Robert Putnam, Harvard University professor, you're joining and participating in a group cuts in half your odds of dying next year. <laughs> right? Smoking also, like quitting smoking, also has good effects on your health. Anyone want to guess what effect that might have? Some of this? Like, what effect does that have on your likelihood of dying next year? Eight percent. Eight percent. Any other guesses? Depending on how long you smoke. Okay, being very precise. <laughs> so the answer is a quarter. Uh, so you can either uh, join a meetup or you can quit smoking. Uh, and in fact, you're actually better off if you joined uh, joined a meetup. You're twice as likely to be alive next year. Uh, as a result, I recommend you doing both. Um, now that's the good news. The bad news. Uh, for the last multiple decades, according to Robert Putnam, participation in local clubs, organization, has been on a steady decline. 58% drop over multiple decades, according to Robert Putnam and his book, Bowling Love. Wonderful book. That's the bad news. Uh, and you might be tempted to say, oh, well, it's the Internet's fault. Everyone's using the Internet. It's actually not the Internet. There's a variety of factors, but one of the biggest factors is actually the bad guy is TV. Right? And if you think about it over the 50s and 60s and beyond, uh, it just became so much easier to sit down on your couch and engage with the TV than it did to go out and find like-minded people and to organize a club. And even if you wanted to, to be a part of, a, of an organization, you just had to figure out how to go and find it. Real, like all kinds of structural challenges that made it nearly impossible, and it's just too much work. 
Uh, so that's the bad news. The good news is we're bringing community back. And what I'm going to share with you is our playbook. There's basically three key things uh, that you need to do if you want to build a strong community uh, that is uh, grounded in uh, local groups. Uh, one, that helps begin with a purpose-driven mission. Two, uh, radically simplify the experience and what it takes to actually make one of these things happen. Uh, and three is spread success. And I'm going to give you a quick, uh, quick little stories about each of these. So on purpose-driven mission, our mission is for it to be a meetup uh, everywhere about most everything. And if you think about the world, you can think about the world as a grid. And on one hand, you've got every interest in the world, like small businesses, knitting, tech, hiking, surfing, whatever. Cancer survivors. Uh, and on the other dimension, you can think of every location around the world. Paris, London, New York, Springfield, smallest town that you might have been to. Um, and our goal is basically, we think about the world in this kind of grid. And if you zoom out, you can add a lot more squares. And we want to basically, like, we want there to be a meetup everywhere about almost everything. The intersection of location and topic, we want there to be many, many meetups about. And our job is to help spread uh, that across the world. And so part of the mission, and what's important about the mission right now, we've got, we believe that there's, so there will be 4 billion people by the year 2020 that will have access to a smartphone worldwide. Uh, and right now, about we are over 20 million members on Meetup. So we're 0.5% of the way towards achieving me. Um, but we believe, really believe that everyone, no matter what town you're in, could seriously benefit from having a group of people near them that shares their interests that they can get together with. It's a profound impact that we can have on people's lives. Um, and just the belief in and of itself causes us to design things differently. The belief that we will eventually get there is an, 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 uh, a strong purpose that says this will be so. There will be a car in every driveway. There will be a, 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 a computer on every desktop. Uh, we, that belief system helps fuel a whole bunch of decisions around how to spark a movement around creating community. We'll come back to that in a minute. So the way we're going to get there, the second thing is radically simplifying what it takes to help people discover, start, and run you. We talked earlier about TV and how easy TV is and how hard it is actually to organize people. These guys did a great job organizing uh, this uh, gathering today. It's not, it's not a meetup, but, uh, but it's very similar in spirit. Um, and that's what we're about. And what I want to tell you about is, is something magical happens. Somebody earlier used the word magical. That was a great word. Something magical happens when you radically strip out the friction from something. Uh, and that is that it allows a whole new class of users to get involved. Right, and a great analogy for it, a great way to think about this is think about photography and the camera market. Right, here's a graph of cameras. Cameras made over the last century. Right, so you got from invention, and then over time it gets cheaper and cheaper to make, and there's people who start creating photo mats. You can now drop off your camera, and you get developed, you can drop off the film, it gets developed an hour. You had a nice steady rise up into the mid 90s. Right? And we all know what happened in the mid-90s to film-based photography. Right? It went completely fell off the cliff and got replaced by this new digital medium that made it radically simpler to take photos, you get instant gratification, you get uh, to delete stuff, you can take tons more photos than you ever could before when you just had that 35 millimeter film. So that's a three, about 3x three growth in the market by, by radically simplifying. Uh, what it meant to have a camera, and how cameras work. But that's not the end of the story, right? What, what took over for, uh, for, for uh, digital cameras is actually the smartphone, right? And I can't even fit it on this graph. Because if I tried, it would actually look a lot more like this. Right? Now, you had said to somebody in the year 1997 <laughs> that there will be this many, this many uh, cameras in production just uh, one to two decades later, they would have looked at you like you had two heads. But that is the power of radical simplification, stripping out friction to allow a much broader base of people. And if you ask any teen these days, like it has radically changed how people communicate. And what other teenager who's using Snapchat or is a teenager. Okay, uh, so that is a story of radical reduction of friction. Point number two for how to create a movement. Uh, number three is uh, where there is success, Replicate. This is a graph. This is not a graph. This is a map. Uh, and this map shows dots of meetup groups that are classified as new tech. 
Uh, and not too long ago, about 10 years ago, there was one dollar on this map, and it was in New York City. Uh, and what happened was, there was a very super successful meetup, and it started creating other people started copying it and replicating it. And they started cell dividing. So it went from kind of tech meetup to uh, Python meetups, and Ruby meetups, and JavaScript meetups, and women who do JavaScript, and then it became lesbians in tech. And now, you know, in the future, it's going to be lesbians who do JavaScript uh, who like to program for video applications, right? It's going to get more and more and more and more precise. Um, and that's exactly what is happening here, uh, and it's about replicating success everywhere. So you start with this beachhead, start with proving out something interesting to great user experience amongst each other, and replicate. So that's what we did. Um, but more interesting is not generally what we did, it's, it's how can you do this for yourselves, right? So what is it that you can do? So I want to tell a story, actually two stories, uh, of how others have done something similar uh, that maybe you can draw lessons from that actually pull from those exact three things that we did uh, that have been allowed us to get together. All right, story number one. You got three people, it's a story about one of these three people. Uh, President Obama, Rick Warren, and uh, Osama bin Laden. What do these three men have in common aside from all being on the cover of Time Magazine? Okay. They are men, good. They all lead, um, have led uh, organizations that are uh, networks of groups that are locally organized. And in doing so, they profoundly changed um, the, the trajectory of, of a lot of people's lives. Um, and, you know, Barack Obama famously, uh, you know, he was a, a, a community organizer. He famously kind of, in part of his election campaign, what helped him get elected was he actually organized his campaign in a way that distributed the power down to local groups of people. And those people organized on his behalf and allowed him to scale uh, in ways that his competitors could not match. Uh, the uh, Osama bin Laden, obviously, uh, with Al Qaeda, is a network of locally, uh, of, of basically local groups of people who um, act sort of basically independently, but under a larger umbrella. Uh, and the story I'm actually going to focus on is the story of Rick Warren. Uh, Rick Warren, for those of you who don't know, is the pastor of the Saddleback Church. Uh, Saddleback Church, and actually, uh, interesting. Uh, I've done a ton of research on Saddleback. I think it's super fascinating. Um, I'm, I'm Jewish, so like I might get some of the religious facts slightly wrong, uh, but bear with me. But Rick Warren has done something really fascinating. If you're not familiar, he started a church out in Orange County, California, uh, about 35 years ago. And that church uh, is called Saddleback Church. And it's got a mission, much like we do. Uh, and it's got a mission like many churches do, in fact. Uh, and it has a uh, part of its plan, though, is he, he says, I want to train an army of people to help go out and spread this mission. Which is a pretty bold ask in general for religion, because the stats on church going over the last two decades uh, are not in his favor. Over the last two decades, participation in churches has gone down by about 20%. And it's forecast to go down in the next decade by another 20%. So a lot of churches look maybe a lot like this. Right, kind of half empty seats, uh, people getting together to, to worship, but but still not a great deal of participation. Rick Warren's sermons look a lot like this. Right, this looks too good to be true. This looks like CGI, uh, you know, Photoshop. This is Rick Warren giving the Easter Sunday sermon in Angel Stadium in Anaheim, California. Right, so there's over twenty thousand people in attendance there, uh, hearing him give this talk. And this is a church that went from nothing 35 years ago, but just about, to that. How did he get there? He got there by having a profound insight around commitment. Right? Many churches are going to go from having none of those 20,000 people who were a part of this church 30 years ago, from no one being aware, to having a great deal of commitment. A lot of churches want people to, to come in, they want them to bring members, uh, and eventually, for many Many churches, the, the model is, in fact, uh, that uh, they receive, they're sustainable by virtue of, of having some proportion of the people give 10% of their income back, right? It's called tithing. Uh, so how do you get somebody from not knowing and not being at all committed to being willing to give 10% of their income to an organization? 
And the answer is by having an insight, by thinking about what's known as a commitment curve. The commitment curve is basically a, an idea that says, let's immediately drop the commitment, figure out how to make it as easy as possible to get involved, and then ramp them up. And what Rick Warren did was something really bold. So a lot of, uh, a lot of churches, a lot of pastors will have a Wednesday night service. Uh, and in that Wednesday night service, he basically got a megaphone to preach out to the crowd. Now, what he did that was actually really bold is he said, I'm not going to stand here and preach to you. In fact, I'm canceling the Wednesday night service. And instead, I want you to break up into small groups amongst yourselves and organize to uh, your own uh, prayer group or, or Bible study on Wednesday nights. And what happens is, is like, what is the experience like when you're amongst a group of 12 people in a room versus the experience of being on the left side of this, of this uh, uh, slide? The right side. Uh, of the, the slide. The, you know, there are people, in, in this side, people are looking out for you. They're, they're looking forward to seeing you. They're aware when you're not there. And there's a much deeper level of commitment. So the people who are involved, it's harder to drop off. You're more likely to stay engaged. You're also much more likely to bring people in. Right? So what happens is that these small groups kind of beget small groups, beget small groups, beget small groups. Right? And suddenly, this side of the picture is much, much bigger than that side of the picture. And it starts to look a lot more like Anaheim Stadium uh, on a weekend, uh, on Easter Sunday. And in fact, the weird or like, kind of profound fact is that actually, in general, across all their church, they have 20,000 participants a week. So basically, they have the equivalent of this every week happening in their organization. Uh, how do they do it? So basically, you know, it's all about small groups. This is, if you go to their website, you'll see that they create a small group. So I typed in 90210, that's the only zip code I know in California. Uh, and lo and behold, what you see is all kinds of small groups for people who want to get together. Uh, at the church, you know, within very, very close proximity, you can see the distance is very, very short. Uh, but you see um, uh, small groups for women, small groups for people with kids, small groups for people who don't have kids, et cetera, et cetera. A really tight fit, which allows them to scale up their organization and draw people in and achieve a kind of result that other churches just aren't seeing. So that's story number one. Let's talk, move away from religion uh, and talk about something completely different. Uh, story number two is performance bicycle. Now, performance bicycle sells bikes. Uh, you, who else sells bikes? Track, that's good. Track and, and the internet, right? Uh, and so, if you're selling bikes these days, you have more competition than ever. Uh, there's a, you know, very likely you're not going to compete on selection. It's going to be very hard to compete on price. Even knowledge is really increasingly difficult to compete on. So that's kind of bad news number one. Bad news number two is you kind of have an aging population of bicyclists. Um, and uh, and it, it's, it's generally there's less people getting involved in the sport. And three, just to make matters worse, is that it's kind of intimidating. Like if you're going to get involved in like competitive or like kind of that kind of bicycling, um, you've got to, like all these equipment decisions you got to make, and you've got these people who seem to know what they're doing, uh, and it, you got a bike you're going to buy, and it's going to be several hundred dollars, if not a thousand. It's a big commitment. Thinking back to that commitment curve, like walking into this bike shop as a brand new cyclist is not way down there on the commitment curve. Right? So what are some strategies you can take? You think for a minute, just pause for a second and think about what you would do if you were in their shoes. Before I tell you what they've done, uh, I'm actually going to tell you what Trek, an example with Trek. Trek has nearly a million followers, or followers, fans. This is Facebook after all. Uh, they have nearly a million fans. And if you look at kind of what their strategy seems to be from a social point of view, you can see that they basically share beautiful photos and videos and all kinds of stuff uh, using their megaphone their, uh, to get their users, ideally, to maybe share that with their friends. So you kind of think back to the, the model of the Wednesday night service versus the small group service. What you're basically looking at uh, in this context is you've got an organization, a company doing broadcast to their million followers, fans, and they're hoping that their followers will rebroadcast. And that's basically the model of how most companies think about social and media. 
right? A lot of rebroadcasting. So the question by itself is what if instead of thinking about rebroadcast, broadcast and rebroadcast, we thought about broadcast and activation, right? And they activated their users up to the curve uh, such that they became more and more engaged and were able to draw more people in with them. And so instead of thinking about a network as like a series of dots that could then fan out and spread your message, what if we thought about a network as a collection of dots of where people have things in common amongst themselves? And what if you thought about actually um, helping them connect with each other, much like, who was it that brought it up earlier? Somebody brought up a Tech Talks session earlier. Um, much like bringing their members together for Tech Talks, um, what if you helped your members connect? Uh, and that's essentially what Performance Bicycle did. So they are following a very similar playbook. They have a purpose driven mission. They could say, hey, we just want to sell more bikes. No, they've said our mission is actually we want to help more people engage in a healthier lifestyle uh, through bicycling. It's an altruistic, authentic, true thing that they're trying to do for people. They've radically simplified how groups get created. In this case, they're, they're actually using Meetup to spread these groups. Uh, and three is they're replicating success. So what they did, here's, a, here's an example. This is a free beginner ride every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. And what's really brilliant is they basically had leaders, but they trained their leaders, their local leaders, they said, show up in baggy pants. Like, show up in sweatpants. Don't wear your fancy, like, super tight thing that, that bicyclists wear. Uh, be really helpful if people need maintenance on their bikes. Just do the maintenance right beforehand. Don't charge them anything. Make it free. Make them easy. Make it as easy as possible for them to get involved. Right? And what happens is that these beginning beginner rides begin to spawn intermediate rides, right? And then there's demand for it saying, hey, well, can you help us figure out how to fix our bikes? So there's kind of free bike maintenance kind of next. And can you feel people getting pulled up that commitment curve? Right? Look at what they're doing. Amazing, right? And so as a result, this is a search I did on Meetup for performance bicycles. They have all their Meetup uh, on all these rides happen using the Meetup platform. You can see, you know, they've got Meetups in Tampa. They've got meetups in San Diego, and outside of Chicago, actually they're in Chicago, in Lincoln Park, pretty much all over. And what you see is they actually have meetups in every every city where they have stores. They have meetups, and more than anything, in many cases, they've got multiple meetups that happen. Why? Because we're talking about that spawning that happens, the replication. Um, but at, you know, the intermediate rides, they get advanced rides. And what happens when people start getting together? Uh, women in the bride say, you know what, it'd be really fun if we just kind of had women only rides. That would be pretty cool. And so they created a women only ride. And I think there's actually one of the rides in, in California is a, a Filipino ride. It's like 100 Filipinos in California getting together. And sure, it won't be too long before there are Filipino women riders, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So it's about spawning and replication for success. And you can see basically there's all kinds of variety. Um, these are photos from the meetups that happen. Right? And then the final piece of the puzzle, which is interesting, is uh, when they use their megaphone now, when they advertise, the call to action in their NPR advertising is not, hey, come to our stores and buy, buy a bike. The call to action is come to our store Saturday morning for a free ride, you know, for a free beginner ride and get involved. Right? And that's what ends up having folks like this. You know, so. As a result of working with folks like this, we actually got dragged into, uh, we, we actually have now released uh, an enterprise version of Meetup to make it easier. I'm not here to sell that. But um, the key, um, actually, if you want to talk to me, I'm happy to it. Uh, but, uh, but the key thing that you want to take away from it, regardless of how you, you, you organize your local community, is around like, having an authentic, um, true, uh, uh, purpose-driven mission that helps people make it radically simple. Get that huge hockey stick growth uh, and spread success. It's, gonna, it's a slower build, but the fire is obviously stronger. So that's me. I can take questions, and if we're if we're advanced on time, I think we're good on time. I want to experiment with something if you don't mind as well. Sure. But let's take questions first. I just want to know I've been sitting on a five hundred dollar kitchen table with my store since last Christmas. <laughs> Yeah, well, I recommend performance bikes. They seem to be very knowledgeable. Very nice people. Yeah. Did you come up with the idea of commit restart? Oh, no. No. I, um, I had a, a 
wonderful opportunity to actually um, hang out in Robert Putnam's kitchen uh, for many hours uh, several years ago. And he taught me all about it through, uh, and he actually is the one who told me the Rick, uh, Rick Warren story. Um, but he's, uh, he's a wonderful guy, really recommend the book. But no, I did not invent it, uh, but I've been leveraging it. Um, so you went through the, kind of like the three key rules. Uh, yes, thank you. Are there, was there a time in your business where you kind of said, oh my gosh, this, might, this isn't working, or this doesn't seem like it's working? I mean, I know personally I've um, said yes, I'll go to some meetups, but I know show, I've, I've never actually been to one, but I'm just saying yes, so I'll show up. And so I'm just curious, like, how, did you guys have any problems with that, or did you have, like, almost like a, I don't know the right word, but, you know, like a meetup that's more like, you know, like you did it, and you got a bunch of your friends, and if you sort of started, like, spawning them that way? Um, yeah, so the question is, is like, are all the meetups kind of naturally organic driven or are we personally spawning? Well, like even in the beginning, or maybe... So in the beginning, yeah. um, it's actually a really interesting wrinkle. Uh, this is a long, long time ago. But what we did is, if you think back to that grid, um, we had a machine in New York, a server, essentially auto-declared that there will be meetups everywhere around the world at 7 p.m. for any one of those given topics on the first nth day of the month. So on the first Thursday of the month, it's International Hikers Meetup Day. And on the first Tuesday of the month, it's International Tech Meetup Day. And the first Wednesday is International Elvis Fans Lovers Day. Um, and it, well, actually, Elvis Lovers Meetup Day. Um, and, um, um, and so we basically had the machine auto-declare, and we layered that on to uh, existing online communities and said, hey, no matter where you are, there's a meetup happening, go here, and if there's enough people at RSVP, we'll declare it, and it'll happen at a spot that a computer in New York will determine. And that was good enough to get interest. However, kind of going back to this push and control to the nodes, it turns out computer in New York uh, was select was uh, encouraging vegans to meet up at steakhouses. Uh, it was also encouraging uh, people on the Atkins diet to meet up at Krispy Kreme. Uh, <laughs> So there was a lot to do. I mean, part of the innovation, what happened there is that we actually saw that there was a lot of demand, there was a lot of desire for this radically simpler way of organizing meetups. And we need to keep making it simpler and simpler. Um, but the power, we didn't push enough of the power to the node, to down to the community. Um, and in holding too much of it, we didn't allow them to take off. And like, for example, 7 p.m. is probably not the best time to have a hiking meeting. Right? It's definitely not the best time to have a mom's meetup. Uh, and when we push the power to the nodes, uh, all of these new things start sprinkling up. Uh, and our challenge now is to continuously think about, okay, like, how do we go back to that venues challenge? How do we actually make it much simpler to figure out where to have your meetup? How do we use our data to suggest better formats um, and help you figure out who's going to play and who's not going to play uh, and account for that? Um, and that's all we're doing. I mean, that's what we have 150 people in New York. Uh, and we're hiring, we're trying to grow the team uh, specifically around that. Like, let's really focus on radical simplification. Uh, but there's still, a, we're, like I said, we're 0.5% of the way there. Okay, I have a question. Yeah. So, getting people off the commitment curve is, of course, the challenge. The main insight and like, what it takes, like, what is the orientation you should have. I certainly know uh, there's a lot of research going on right now. Certain demographics are motivated because they have personal desire and certain demographics need to be invited, but then once they even think they were allowed to participate, and once they're invited, they, they step up. But uh, what's the mix? What do you do? How do you get people going? Yeah, a lot of the growth we've seen his, um, historically has been in part through un very entrepreneurial people. Right? So every one of those dots in the tech world, in part was um, because somebody said, I'm going to plant a flag and I'm going to make it happen. Um, more often than not, though, they saw someone else doing it, or they were part of the meetup that was right, but not quite right enough. It wasn't like uh, sell the ladder enough, it wasn't specific enough for their needs. So they went ahead and said, I'm going to make it happen. But there's still, uh, in the system as we've designed it, there's still kind of the need for that very entrepreneurial person. Um, I suspect, my personal feeling is that that will continue to be the, the need or just paid or yes, how's that going? Did we, uh, so we, did, how did our business model evolve? We started as completely free, um, and I made meetups for $14 of revenue. Uh, by offering venues the right to host meetups. So I called them Chili Bowl in Washington, D.C., and they were 
and we're going to give us $14 to host, I don't even remember what we've done. Uh, the model evolved, the CV1, when we went to the groups model, it evolved actually to be more of a subscription based uh, on a per group basis. Um, and it's largely stayed in that realm uh, since then with some optimizations around tiers, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously, at the enterprise level, uh, but it's still all thought of as a subscription based uh, service. All right, well, I want to experiment with something. I don't want to be a hypocrite. So I talked about Rick Warren kind of getting himself out of the way and helping people turn to each other. Um, and so I want to do a little experiment, if it's OK with, with sure. you. Um, you're going to go get drinks soon, right? Um, and how do we help you guys connect with the right people in this room so you can like have the best possible experience uh, while you're drinking beers? Or whatever you try you decide to drink, to drink. So I've actually done this with a meetup group that I happen to lead um, in New York, and it works really, really well. You just have to give yourself to it and, and kind of uh, have a little bit of courage right now. Um, but what I'm going to ask you to do is, you guys are, are like-minded individuals. You have something to offer or something to ask of this community. It works better if you offer, but uh, you know, it's okay to ask. Uh, you have something that you're passionate about, and you all share stuff around it. So there's something that you're dying to talk about at drinks. Um, that's a good thing to bring up. So what I'm going to ask you to do is don't raise your hand. Just take turns standing up. Not everyone has to stand up, but we'll, we'll, we'll let a handful of folks stand up. Declare either something you have to offer this community or something you would like to ask of this community um, or something you want to talk about at drinks. And also, say your name um, and don't go into a long, long spiel um, about whatever it is you want to do. Just kind of real succinct. Feel, much like uh, Gregory said you should do when pitching a journalist. Uh, so I'll kick it off. Um, I, my ask, well, I, I hope this is my offer, but my, my ask is not just that you participate in this little uh, experiment. Uh, we're looking for like a, a, a VP marketing, like a, a head of marketing. Uh, and so if you know wonderful people in, uh, who want to help us achieve our mission in growing our marketing and building out a marketing team, uh, please come talk to me. That's my ask. Um, who's got an ask or an offer? Yes. I got one. Good. So uh, <laughs> I'm with a company called Facebook Advisors. My name is Zachary Wayne. Uh, we are not one of those criminal ISO <laughs> payment companies. Now. So work with us if you like to. <laughs> yep. I'm a. Uh, oh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Hi. Um, my name is Shelley. I work on Intuit. And um, I'm trying to figure out how to. Operationalize partnerships better so we can get the market faster. So if people have like best practices that work for them, or maybe things that just like didn't work at all, I'd be really happy to talk about those. Uh, my name is Joe Pagano. This is 